Ho, ho, ho. Season's greetings from Agent Cooper and the gang and all those Douglas firs up here in Twin Peaks. Welcome to Twin Peaks Unwrapped. I'm your host, Ben Durant, and beside me is... Brian Kazaska. Hi, Brian. Hey, Ben. How's it going? Going well. Today, we have On the Air, Episode 6. Yep, and it was written by Robert Angles and directed by Betty Thomas. Yes, Betty Thomas. Did you know she also directed such shows as Doogie Howser, MD, Parenthood. She also directed the movies 28 Days, Dr. Doolittle, and Grace and is currently she just directed an episode of Grace and Frankie. Ah, so she's cool. she's still in the industry. Uh, I think she's done some acting, but mm. she's done a lot of directing of different shows. Um, very cool that she's still in the industry. Very cool. And this is a you know we no longer have any shows that have aired in the U.S. This is now unaired. This is an unaired, unaired episode. episode. So this episode I I actually liked a lot. I know you it wasn't your favorite. I. I will say there's. I think the script is well written. I think there's some really good zingers. I'm not sure I like the ending. I see. I like the ending. I'll give you the ending. It is crazy. We'll get to it. But what? Why I like this is because it is less zany. Less really. Less <laughs> zany. Less zany. Really? Less sound effects. Less, I'll give you a sound effects. Yeah. I would still say it's zany. In in, in, in the um. The jokes aren't so, like, over the top that you're cooking a chicken on an electric chair. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know what you're saying. I'm comparing it to my least favorite episode. But I like this episode a lot. I don't know why I like the plot. I like, like, last week's episode. It felt more grounded, less bonkers. Yes. More on par with a, with a central theme. They do it. Then it gets zany. For some reason, when you, you're zany all the way through, the ending part doesn't kick for me but when it's a build to the zany it's a build up i kind of like it more okay to me this I is a build that. it's I, a build i get the build yeah it's interesting that bob angles did episode three which had to deal with i think the quiz show and yes. it got kind of mystical or there was magic involved you're with right. potions and all of a sudden he's re- he's done this one and there's some magic involved as oh, well oh you're I, right that's a good uh correlation i didn't yeah, I, I guess he's into the magic I yeah guess, i mean now i want to relook at his work in twin peaks and fire walk with me and did he bring on the magic i don't know you know the only magical i mean there's a lot of mystical things in twin peaks but in season three there is a magical character that we never really got to know red he made the coin disappear, and oh, yeah. he appeared in Richard's well, mouth. Well, Bob Angles was involved with that. that was all I Mark understand, Frost and David Lynch, but, but I'm just yeah. saying, like, it's, int- it's just Oh, yeah, I think character. about that all the time. Me I too. think about Red. I'm like, I, I still want to believe it was on the cutting room floor. I want to believe that someday we'll get the missing pieces. Yeah, of the Red subplot. Of the Red subplot. Because I feel like this, I will not give up on season four, but sometimes I kind of wonder, is, like, is, he, is, is there material already shot for season four? As in, like, we didn't use it in season three, and now we can actually include Maybe. it in season four. <laughs> I don't know. It's just Red doing magic I want to believe that there's stuff out there still that if they wanted to tell more story, they don't even need to shoot more. It's already available to them. Because it's, it's really bizarre to me that Red was in it. He does his coin thing. He has a hug with his Shelly. And then that's the last we see of him. There's no more in it. I feel like there was. I feel like his character was going somewhere, or maybe it wasn't. But it seemed to me like mm. there was more to his character. Ben, I want to get you a poster. I want Bobby to arrest him for yes, for, doing, for, well, for, for being an asshole <laughs> and arrest him too. Yeah, because for drugs. He, the he drugs. Brought in the, uh... So I want to get you a poster. <laughs> Hang in there. No, no, no. I, yeah, that's a good one too. It's a poster. 
And instead of UFO, it's a cherry pie flying in the sky. It says, I want to believe. In and season four. Season four, it has, like, Lynch's hair coming out of the bottom like a tree, like the I, X-Files poster. That, I like that. Yeah, but it's a pie instead of a UFO. All right, that works I me. want to believe in season four. Yes. <laughs> Aww. So you're right. This episode does have a uh, mag- magician, a gypsy magician. So we'll get right into it. Scene one. Shorty drives in this gypsy traveling box while Blinky is walking by. Like, Shorty drives in, takes this big box, this big red box, puts it on the ground. And then Blinky's walking by, and he's got a big box filled with props. He spills it. He spills the props everywhere. And then he looks at this man sitting in a chair, which we don't know who this man is yet. Yes. And there's, like, a connection, I think, between the two. Like, Blinky looks at him, and he's, like, smiling. It's yes. It's like weird, like, there's something with these two that connect. It's funny they say we need real gypsy music. But I don't know why it brings that up, or maybe because the skit is going to have to do with gypsy. Yes. But I wasn't sure if they were making a connection to this man. Because the man, but he seems disheveled. He seems yes. out of it. I don't know. He's in La La Land. Yeah. Blinky, he just, he, he, as he's looking at the guy sitting in the chair, he sees hammers and a little dog barking. Yet again, these things have nothing to do. Well, I mean, the hammer could be that from the box, but the little dog barking. You know, we had a dog barking for the last episode. It's the weirdest things he sees. Yes. Very weird. He's got, yeah, he's just got uh, special senses. In... <laughs> <laughs> special, he's a Spider-Man. Yes. Scene two, Dwight confronts the plumber about all this gigantic pipes. What? Well, that all looks a little... In the way, doesn't it? You think so? I, I'm worried that, that people might hit their heads on all of this. I mean, this, this is temporary, isn't it? Does this look temporary to you? We have, we, these pipes go directly to an area where we have to work. Now, it's weird. It's water pipes. Why are these pipes, like, all around the place? This is the most bizarre yeah, they thing have to, ever. They have to duck under them, and, it, and it's, it's using their space that they need. It's a backstage space. Space that's getting yeah. in the way. Yes. And the plumber's excuse is, well, this is an old building. I would have preferred to put in a new ceiling. Maybe even gut the entire building. But this is the very best I can do, all right? Comically huge. Yes. This is like a human could go down these pipes, like <laughs> Mario, and go into a warp zone. They're so big. Yet again, this episode continues last week's episode with head injuries. We will double the head injuries in this episode. Yet, yet again, the head injury... Count goes up. Very weird. It's so funny it stuff. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, if you think about it, it seems like even I remember the restaurant episode from episode two, the waiters banging their heads in the wall. I mean, oh, that's, that's true. Just... Yeah, back then, we would make fun of head injuries. Yeah. Now it's a very ser- serious thing. And back then, it was com- it was comedy gold. Oh, yes. <laughs> and it's interesting because the plumber makes this gesture that looks like it, it looks like money, like yes. he wants more money. We have to do. Hey, look, show look, look, what am I doing here? Huh? Huh? You want more money? I'm playing a very sad song on the world's smallest violin. But he wasn't doing the violin thing. He was doing the money thing, which was kind of funny. And then Bert, which we see sparsely, walks out dressed as a wizard. He's reading his lines. And what does he do? He smacks his head on the pipe. Even though Dwight was like, someone's going to smack their head on these pipes. And Bert is the first one down. I mean, they're there just for everybody to to get hurt. Yeah. (laughs) And then the Hurry Up Twins even walk into the pipes. The Hurry Up Twins. Hurry Up. Hurry Up. Hurry Up. Hurry Up. Hurry Up. Bud goes after the plumber because he sees that Dwight is just a weenie. He's not going to take care of it. So Bud goes over to the plumber. Listen, pal. These pipes are going to have to be moved. What? I said these pipes are totally unacceptable. You'll have to move them. Say that again. I'll tell you a short story. Thumbnail sketch. The Korean conflict. I was left to hold a position alone. The enemy numbered 45. I ran out of ammo. I was left with nothing but a small razor in my dop kit. I'm still here. But those poor 45, well, there's a child in the room. I'm sorry. So now we're getting history about Bud. Yes. He's a war veteran. Yes. Um, he tells he's seen us, some things. Huh? Oh, he's seen some things. And he tells the plumber about this in the... The plumber just breaks down and basically says to him, I'm sorry. I'm just upset. <laughs> Things aren't right at home. 
They're not right at all. It's your castle, pal. Go home and act like it. Thank you. And it's so fun. The plumber has a kid, which I'm assuming is his kid. Yes. But they're both, like, as the show progresses, they'll be wearing, like, a tank top, and they're all, like, they got soot and sweat, and, they, <laughs> and the kids got mud and dirt all over them. They look like they belong in, like, like the 50s or yes. something. They look out of place. Well, it is 1957. So they look exactly <laughs> where they belong. I keep forgetting what year this show takes place. What year is it, Brian? I don't know. <laughs> Any anything about that scene you like, Ben? The way you say the whole castle thing, I feel like he was more like, "That's your castle. You take care of it." Meaning that he's like, "You're the man of the house. Yes. You should you should put her in her place." Yeah. I, the way you make it come, it's like the home is you gotta take care of your home. But like the way Bud, I guess I'm like softening uh, yeah, Bud's. Bud is not like that. He's kind of like that is your castle. You you better take you gotta take care of it. In the sense that like you're the man. That's how I read it. That he's like you yeah. put everybody in their place and stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, I totally agree. <laughs> Uh, scene three. So the crew gathers around for an announcement from Bud. Joining them for tonight's show is the great Presido. And again, the, so the the uh, the owner of the company loves magic there. Yeah, Mr. Z. Mr. Like Z. he loves magic, so that's why we have this guy on the show. Yeah, we want this great uh, gypsy gypsy magician Presido. Um, they see this stranger. Sitting just aimlessly staring at a wall, and and Bud is like basically thinks he's a homeless man, yes. and tells him to get the hell out of here. Now when he arrives, I want each and every say, pal, soup kitchen's down the block. McGonagall, there's a man standing here who looks as if he combs his hair with a fork. So Shorty is gonna escort him out, and then Mr. Z had this sign that was the Egyptian magician's sign, and it's on a chair, and as He's escorting him out. He sees the sign, and he sees the guy, and he realizes, oh, crap. This That's is him. Yes. What is going on? Right. And the big thing about this uh, a magician is that he's got this trick, and I think it's to do with a box, and like yes. it's never been performed. Nobody else has ever been able to perform it. It's such a special thing. And again, again Bud thinks that like this trick is going to give them great ratings. and it's, <laughs> it's A rating bonanza. Yeah. Yeah, like, this is going to be it, folks. Every week, they got to look for the next big thing because yes. everything fails. They're probably getting really good ratings because in, in the 50s, there weren't many channels. Like, two, three. Yeah. They're and probably... at the same time, I, sometimes, I mean, you know what? You think it's things like um, America's Home Video. That show is still on, and that show was back on in the 90s, I think it came out. So it's been over 25 years, that show. And people, I think, tune into that show because they want to see the silliest things that happen to people. People getting hit Kicking in the, the balls. balls and stuff. <laughs> I mean, I think it's something like if you were going to watch a show and you're like, you don't know what's going to happen. That's, I mean, that is the beauty of live television. Yeah. Maybe some people probably like Saturday Night Live because – Sometimes they mess up. They, yeah, that's they my laugh, favorite. They that's laugh, my favorite. Uh, uh, they're doing the skits and they can't control yeah. it. And who's going to laugh first? And so I think there is something special about live television. And then to know, hey, I know last week uh, they screwed it up and they did this and this. Let's tune in again to see what happens. Yeah, you're right. I, I, if a show existed like this today, I'd definitely be watching. Um, do you remember when 30 Rock was on? 30 Rock started doing live episodes. I think they did at least one. You're right. Yeah, and they did. it was and I, so cool. And the coolest thing, if I remember right... They did it, so they would do it live for the East Coast. In the West Coast. In the West Coast. Yeah. And ER did something like that one yes. episode as well. So, yeah, I, there is something special about live. Yeah. There is something just so, because it's like theater for TV. Uh -huh. Like, you're going there to see a special moment where you don't get to do it again, and whatever happens, happens, and you got to be, it's, it can be spontaneous sometimes. Yeah, I love it. So, they realize, hey, we're going to actually kick out the Presido, the, the guy. He's not homeless. But he's messed up. I think some of them even thought he was connected to the plumber or yes. the mechanic, or he was like. He, 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 uh, so they're kissing up to him, and uh, Presidio says, "Mr. Presidio, Mr. Presidio, uh, perhaps we've uh, gotten off on the wrong foot here. Or perhaps you're tired traveling from your last job. Uh, things went okay on your last job, didn't they? I gave a lot of people gas. Sometimes this work can be pretty rough. It was full service." Oh. Which was one of my favorite lines. Uh, like, he thinks he's a gas attendant. Presido says, when he sees the dog, he had a dream. Ah! Is that dog smoking? Pardon me? 
I dreamed of a dog like that. He was wearing a hat and smoking a cigar. He brings transformation. Oh. I had a dream of a dog with a gray hat and he sm that is smoking a cigar. He brings transformation. So they're setting you up. There's yes. going to be payoff. I haven't found this, but it makes me think of like legendary stories. Like you have a character that's lost all his powers and he, yes. he, 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 he has a vision that like he, or somebody gives him, tells him this vision that if you run into so-and-so, you will get your powers back or yes. something like that. And yes. I kind of feel like this is a, like, like that kind of a story, like a make-believe fairy tale story that's being told. Crack the code, get your powers back. <laughs> And then Blinky hits the music, which is the Egyptian music. And it makes Presto dance and smile at Blinky, which yet again, they have this weird connection. It's kind of like this weird telepathic thing I think is going on between these two. So there's these clues. There's music involved. It's almost like Twin Peaks. You have these clues laid out in front of you. Uh, will they unlock the mysterious uh, magician? And we I question whether the, like this is out of place for the show. I question whether like does this belong in, on uh, on the air? Like well, this? who wrote this episode? Robert well, Angle. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> he he he's the one that did the potions for the quiz show. Yeah. And I'm kind of like, do we need to go far out there with these supernatural? Not even supernatural. It's just like these. Uh, I would go new supernatural. Maybe like these like bells and it just seems out of place for the show. To yeah. Me. So I guess I disagree. In a way, I kind of just I kind of go with it. Yeah. Because. It, it's presenting itself. If, if it just happened out of nowhere, I would agree with you. I guess I look at it that way. I'm presented a magician, a great magician, so I expect great things. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But if it was like Lester Guy who did it, then I'd be like, that's stupid. Okay. That's how I see it. Interesting. Yeah. So scene four, Bud and Lester are in the control room. Now, one of my favorite gags of this episode is Bud, his shirt is seared. Fire came out of that phone. We missed it. One of my favorite gags from That's episode what, one. I was wondering. So you're right. I was wondering why did I not know what that meant. But you're right. He, the the he fire got came a call out from uh, the owner, Mr. Z. That, Mr. Z. Well, what happens is he calls Mr. Z to tell him, "Hey, we have him here." But he thinks he, he he's in Cuckoo Land and he thinks he's a a gas attendant. And Mr. Z gets pissed. Or he could have been pissed that like, oh yeah, he was here, we didn't know it, and we he almost we almost threw him out. Yeah, yeah, and the fire would would have come out of the phone and burned his his uh, shirt off. So do you think it was edited out? Do you think we, we it, it, ha it must have happened? Why would you or are, are we as the the viewer supposed to just remember just remember. way back from the pilot? Because I kind of feel like that was probably an expensive gag. So if you gave it – in our minds, I knew uh, right away. I was like, oh, fire came out and it seared his shirt. And I didn't. So <laughs> yeah, I should have. I should have put it together. I mean it's kind of a cool gag to do it this way. It probably cost them less money to yes. have flames coming out of a phone. Right. And then Lester uh, – so he hangs back while uh, – Yeah, and Bud has on, to go out and figure out how right. to fix this. And they're, they're, they're in the control room. And there's a... Uh, the clipboard with a, a piece of paper on it. Right. That says The Betty Hudson Show. Yeah, I think it's The Betty Hudson Show starring, guess, uh, Lester Guy, it's I believe. starring or, uh, or featuring? Or... Yeah, Lester Guy, and he's at the very bottom. This reminds me yet again of uh, 30 Rock when Tracy Morgan comes on the show. And then all of a sudden it becomes a Tracy Morgan show. Yes. Um, and how she... And uh, What's-Her-Face gets jealous. It's the same premise here because Betty's be beloved and lesser guy nobody uh, cares about. So I question who who did that because it it's in the control room. So it had to be either Bud, the director, or it could have been Dwight. Right. Because there's only three people we ever see in there. Right. And I guess, I mean, I feel like it has to be Bud. Yeah. Because, I mean, I, like, 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 there's an idea rattling in him saying, yeah. oh, this show, if we can't get th tonight to work. And the ratings keep sinking. We have to make Betty the star of the show because we're maybe this whole time, this whole time, it's them trying to figure out a way to get Betty off. But when Betty is getting all the love and none of their guests are working out, yeah, I almost feel like uh, Bud's just like, okay, we have to, we're gonna have to give Betty the the, the marquee yeah. because maybe that would get more people to watch. 
It'd be interesting to know, like, if I did my research to know if there's other shows out there that have done that. Like, where you I'm had a star, sure. and there was somebody else that realized it was bigger, and the show became that show, or maybe... Me, Sony Rock somebody. is the only one I can think of, yeah. but I'm but sure I mean, there like, are I'm thinking of actually, like, a real, a real, like, show, like a real talent show that another person became kind of the star. I'm mm. sure they're out there. I can think of one instance. It's, uh, it's kind of a stretch, but I will say The Simpsons... Outgrew and became a lot bigger than Tracy Ullman. And that's where The Simpsons started. It was a Tracy Ullman show. The Simpsons was a five, was like maybe a two to three minute cartoon between right. the commercials. And then that became so popular, Fox gave them their own show. Yeah. And now it's still on. Now, Tracy Ullman still has a show on HBO. Yeah, a new show, right. But yeah, she's gone, coming gone com- over the yeah, years. She's, yeah, she does sketch comedy. But The Simpsons took over the world when it came yeah. out. It's funny. You know what I thought you were going to say? I what? thought you were going to say the show was about Bart Simpson, and it really became about Homer. Oh, I give like, you a better example. Family Matters. Family Matters yes, started off a as example. a normal family show. Steve Urkel became so popular that the family was secondary at some point. You're right. Yeah, that's a great example. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. Urkel became everything. Right. People watch Family Matters for Urkel, yeah. not for the did family. Did I do that? Yeah, 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 yeah. And you're like, yeah, you did. You ruined <laughs> Family Matters. <laughs> it should have just been called the Urkel Show. It's uh, featuring Family Matters. So scene five, Betty is talking to Presido at Craft Services. Um, I'm sorry you're not a magician. I may have been once. I dreamed about the dog. It was a nightmare. Talking about a horse or a dog? I'm talking about a shadow walking the earth. Lester? I fear the dog of transformation. No, Snaps is not a Dalmatian. But I don't think he's trying to hurt you. He wants to be your friend. And the dog returns with a hat and a cigar. And she gets startled. Spill some coffee onto her dress, which is this gigantic heart. It's a very uh, gaudy-looking thing. And this gives you a glimpse that he has the magician in him still. He sees that she's sad, and she's got the coffee. And he goes over to craft services and grabs the um, tablecloth and rips it underneath. And everything stays on the table. And she gets to wipe it up. And I'm like, ooh, that shows that he's still right. there. He's still got it. He's waking up. Yes. The force awakens. <laughs> <laughs> Lester is staring at the Betty Hudson show paper. Back and in his dressing room. Back in his dressing room. He's getting upset. He also gets this strange delivery. We don't know what that is yet. And he's crying over the paper, which is very humorous because it would cut to the piece of paper and you just hear drops like it's raining almost it's and his dry. face looks dry Aww. like you just see, it's really funny and nicole sees him and tries to calm him down and one of my favorite lines of this episode it's very cartoonish is uh nicole saying curse you betty hudson steady on girl we are alone you know and it's very, like, evil. It's very, yes. like, an evil a yeah. cartoon character. Like, it reminded me of Powerpuff Girls or something. Right. Like, one of those cartoons. Well, then, I mean, the, the fu- I, it's funny you say that because I thought the funny part of that was she says that. And then Lester says something like, we're in, our, we're in the dressing room. You don't have to yes. be so loud or something yes. like that. Like, it, it, it's like it's just you and I. It's one thing if you're out there with I know, everybody else. I know. I thought that was kind of a funny. Yeah. And, you know, she reminds she remind me of Vader Zim. Like, that very curse you um, thing. But, yeah, you're right. Like, why are you yelling? We're, <laughs> we're the only people in this room. So Nicole tells him he can steal the show from Betty tonight. Lester, this is your chance. Oh, it's no use. I'm finished. <laughs> it is? This is your chance to steal the show. Like Betty always does. You're right. What are you talking about? Don't you see? I bought this for you. It's all right here. You can learn to do magic. Do you think I could? Oh, there's nothing to it. And I'm sure we can talk Mr. Budwaller into it. Oh, you're right. I see all the directions I hear. <laughs> and he could steal the show from Betty, and Presido is just a lame duck at this point, so you could you could save the show, and Betty will be a nobody again, and you'll be the hero. And this is their big plan. Actually, this might be one of the best plans they've ever come up with. Best I mean, laid out plan ever. <laughs> right? I mean, you've got the instructions on how to do magic. All you gotta do is, is, is practice and 
do it. This is Lester Guy we're talking about here. <laughs> I don't think he practices anything. Uh, he, you know, he does practice miming a lot. Yes, he's, you know, he's, he's always <laughs> miming. I don't know. It's very bizarre. So scene seven. Lester is trying to do the card trick with Bert. Nicole's behind Bert miming what the card is. And Lester, because he's a dimwit, he's like, it's the, f- it's the five of knuckles. knuckles. And she's like saying, I think she's saying aces. Diamonds. Diamonds. Oh, because if you put a diamond on your finger, you're right. And he's like, five of knuckles. And she's like, you idiots. Like, Come on. I love that, like, right behind Lester, you still see pipes. So there's just pipes, pipes everywhere. everywhere. Yeah, yeah, the pipes. <laughs> just... Oh, an interesting gag in this episode. When they're having dialogue, you will hear a pipe getting hit. You'll hear yeah. someone hitting a pipe because later on, everyone will have bandages on their foreheads. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> so here's something. What do, you, what do you make of this? The magician comes out. And uh, I think the, the, the group of them, Lester they and huddle. The t- huddle together. Yeah. But... The magician comes out, and you see the clock, and all of a sudden, yes. clock, the clock is spinning, and time is going by, it seems. Is that how, What do you make of a spinning clock? Okay, so this is what I think happens. It fades to black. Here, pause it. Yeah, I saw. Yeah. So, this is what I think happens. They huddle, because they say, we have to have this plan done, and we're going to be going live in an hour. The clock spins to make it look like they've been, time is passing. It cuts to commercial, but when it comes back, the clock is flying, and it shows the magician staring at the clock. He's moving the clock with his head. I think that's all that's happening. He's making the clock spin. So time isn't going anywhere. He's just messing around with the clock. Yes. Okay. But they all have their heads down. Yet again, they don't notice this. I just didn't know if we were if, if time was passing, if we were going, if time travel. I thought happening. the same thing. My first watch, my second watch, I got it. I was like, oh, it's him. He's moving the clock. But nobody's noticing it. They still think he's a lame duck, yes. but he's awakening. I he's, guess, right. So it's supposed to be another example that he does have magic. Yes. He's got powers beyond our imagination. And also, just to go back to that card trick, Guy does a, a, um, a callback to episode two, I believe. His magic word is... I say the magic words, which are... Piccadilly Circus? Yes, which was the movie he was in. Yes, that's the movie he was in that got him this job. Nice. Which I thought was kind of cool. Which was also uh, Mr. Z's favorite film. Yes, yeah. exactly. It was so kind of cool. If you're going to do any magic word, that would be a great one for... Good luck. Good luck. Yeah. So everyone's getting ready for the for the show, but Guy still can't do the card trick. Nicole's freaking out and yells at everyone and has a backup plan that they'll keep the great Presido Pers- away from Guy. Bud hits his head on the pipe among everyone. Uh, so Bud, he gets smacked in the head. They have another plan to keep Guy away from the magician because um, Guy's got to steal the show. Now, this scene gets a little confusing. It's a setup for the payoff we got in the beginning of the show. Mm. Help me out with this, Ben. So Nicole shows up into the dressing room with Betty. She gives Betty the dog a hat and a cigar. Now, if you all remember, that's what's going to have the awakening for the magician. She says that Lester will be saying some magic word. You need to come out with these items. Yes. There's been a slight change in the show, Betty. We're adding a gag. Who are you going to tie up? Listen to me, Betty. There isn't much time. Lester will be on stage and he is going to say the magic word. And when you hear it, you bring the dog out. Oh, I tie up the dog. Doesn't he have a leash? Why are you so thick? You gooey, sticky, soggy blob. It's so simple. When you hear the magic word, light the cigar, put the hat on snaps, and bring the dog on stage. What's the magic word? Idiot. Just do what I say. And then, like, it's really funny because Betty just goes, Idiot. (laughs) (laughs) It cracks me up. So here's how I understand. I believe at the beginning of the episode, uh, the magician is a little bit uncomfortable with the dog. So oh. I think, I think since Nicole wasn't there when he talked, when the magician talked to Betty, yeah, she's under- understanding that maybe the dog will make him run away and get- leave the stage. That's my interpretation. Oh, all right, thing. all right, yeah, okay, it makes but sense. But what we know 
is if she he has the outfit on, it actually will t- help trigger the yes. magician. But he, I think th- Nicole wasn't part of that conversation when gotcha. Betty and, That makes sense yeah. now. So she, but I think she's the idiot. It, was, it felt a little convoluted. It was, I know I was watching. It's like, what's going on? Why is the dog involved? In yeah, because I was like, there's a magic trick with the dog now? I yeah, don't remember like, that it, at right, all. Right. Yeah, it's a 22-minute episode. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot going on here. Um, it's a very busy episode to Honest with you. Um, so scene 10, Dwight calls the plumber to get rid of the pipes, but lies to Bud. We're stuck here with, with any number of pipes, disrupting the ebb and flow of a very important production. Stop, stop. Thank you. There was no answer. Busy signal. He'll be right over. Oh, from so far away, she called to me. Uh, Mike, it's so weird they gave Bu- they gave Dwight the high pitched voice. He's talking to his hand. Well, I mean, it's zany. It's, it's just, zany. It's, it's weird. Zany, yes. It's weird. Scene eleven. Guy is supposed to step into this box. All right. So the the idea is they'll have the box. They'll have some smoke. He'll step into the box and he'll disappear. But so they're playing around with the box and Nicole's like, "Well, smoke. I step in. I get out. The box spins. Boing, boing, boing. I got it." <laughs> Here, I'll show you. Oh, Lester, you're going to be wonderful. (sighs) Now close the door, Lester. And the door has a spring to it, so it slams shut and the latch comes off. I said, uh, close the door, Lester. So then now Nicole is stuck in the box. Lester is trying to put the latch back on. He hears, get ready for going live. So Lester's like, screw it. He throws the latch. He runs away. <laughs> the stagehands come in and wheel that box off on stage. And Nicole's stuck inside. So we're going into the final scene in the episode. Uh, this is the show. The show starts. Everyone, including the, the announcer's assistant to the crew, all have head injuries. <laughs> they all have bandages. I don't even know if I noticed this, and I've watched it a few times. The I woman don't... who sprays the per- the uh, the breath spray into the announcer, she got a he- she got a bandage on her forehead. That's hilarious. And the crew has bandages, and everybody's got bandages. The whole crew has bandages, and then we cut to a hospital scene where there's a guy with a bandage and a broken arm, and maybe they're just. Random, but I do wonder, could they be related to the crew? Could I think so. I, be, I think there's some sort of correlation here. I, I don't know. Just... These could be injured people who work on the show. Yes, I wonder if that could have happened. There's a nurse? Yes. Yeah, it's too I can't funny. tell. Like, the guy uh, the guy with the head wound, he doesn't look like anybody from the show, but it would have been funny if, if it was somebody. If we had seen them in early on working. I think that would have been funny. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so guy shows up. And he's in front of the box. They come down with the hose. They're putting fog everywhere. You can't even see anything because the fog is too thick. Guy can't see anything. He tries to do a, ma- a weird magic trick, which we didn't see in practice. He puts a glass under his chin and a glass in his mouth with water in it. And I'm like, what is he doing? He's like, <laughs> going to make the water travel? I, I-, I didn't get it. Was it was very bizarre. Very bizarre. As he's trying to do this glass trick, Inside the magic box is Nicole yelling, get me out of here, get me out of here. So as she's yelling, get me out of here, Mr. Presto sees the dog with the hat, with a cigar in its mouth, and Blinky cues the Egyptian music. Time for the great Presidio. Go. All of a sudden, this all comes together, and uh, Mr. Presido folds his arms. He disappears. He reappears in full magician garb. Yes. And he has been awoken. He points to the box that Lester Guy's next to, his trick box, and all the items come out of it and start floating in midair. And Lester guy's like, what is going on? And then he turns to the box, points at it. The box spins. The doors open in a newt with Nicole's head on it. He turns Nicole into a newt. It's not a lizard? It's a lizard not, uh, or uh, newt. Uh, I would say newt because newt yeah. was with magicians. But it could be a lizard. All right, I'll go with newt. Walks out and she's screaming. <laughs> And it reminds me of the mo- the, I'm shaking my head right now. It reminds me of the bug thing from season three. Oh, this man. is the origin just, story. Well, yeah, he don't have wings, but yeah. yeah. And Lester Guy freaks out. 
he then shrinks Lester Guy. Then Lester Guy appears in the palm of Mr. Presido's hand. And then he asks Betty for a wish. Lovely lady, your wish is my command. What do you wish of the gypsy traveler? I've never been to Akron. Bazumba! Ladies and gentlemen, the gypsy traveler! Yeah, I thought at first she said, um, I thought she said Austin or something, yes. but I think she, I actually think it's um, um, a town in Ohio. Akron, Ohio. Yeah. That's where she, um. Maybe that's where she's from. Yeah. So she says to be there, and he's like, okay, and then he slaps Lester Guy in the palm of his hand, and Lester Guy appears uh, on a phone booth at Akron, Ohio, and it looked, looked like a tire factory or a dump or junkyard. Yeah, that's right. And uh, calling for a ride back home. Buddy, hello, it's Lester. Lester guy. I, I seem to be a bit off my boil. Mm. I, I, I was wondering if you could advance me bus fare back to Gotham. <laughs> yeah, that's how they end the show. And I feel like they've jumped the shark. I they probably like, did. I agree. I agree. But I liked I think, it. I, I don't think know why. most of it was okay. I think I was okay with the, most of the show until we got to that ending. And it felt like a quick ending. It was like, bah, 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 bah. and it's like, what? where is this going? And this, I mean, in a way, it reminded me a lot of episode four because four had the weird thing where he ended up on the roof. You know? Yeah. It was like, where can we have Lester Guy end up now? Almost. Like, where, yeah. What bizarre place can Lester Guy show up? But him, for him to suddenly disappear and be miles away, I think that, yeah. I don't know. And then Shrink and Newt and Nicole the Newt. And I don't know. I felt like <laughs> I had problems. And I, I get the premise that the premise was that Bud wanted something amazing, never seen before on television. And they something, got it. They got it. Yeah. But it, it's, it's beyond disbelief. It's beyond, it's just. But the people watching, like, when he disappears, like, what? Like, it showed people at home, like. Hitting their TV, like, I can't believe I just saw this. I almost feel like I almost would be okay with, with uh, Lester disappearing, but to have Nicole turn into lizard. I don't know. That's and it, funny. It, with her head, like, it wasn't even just like a lizard coming out of the box, because that I could believe, but for her to actually have I her know. head on a. Superimposed on yeah. a lizard. I know. It was cheesy. But I don't know. I liked it. Uh, cool. Yeah. It's, it I, wasn't your favorite. It was, it was mine. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> I much rather, I much liked uh, Mr. Peanut episode so much more. Like, yeah, I that's thought, a good one too. That, that was a. Good a one. I think I just love the ending that you come together and stuff. And this one is just kind of like it's a wacky like, scenario. I feel like I'm scratching my head is like, huh? I know. It's like in the next week, are we, it, we're not going to even talk about this. There's not going to be anything about. I am excited to see what episode seven is going to bring us. Right. You know, it's been a while since I've seen it. A long time since I've seen it. I'm curious to know. It does it feel like an ending? Like, is there some kind of a conclusion or some kind of I don't know something that wraps up or some kind of feel like that Betty, these characters have grown? Betty gets her own show and Lester Guy gets fired. There you go. And That's then, my prediction. On the air, that would be a great. Wouldn't that be cool? Because then you could have season two be Betty's show, and then Lester Guy trying to get his job back. Yes, yeah. I think that would be interesting. You wrote you wrote season two. We, me and you could just write this <laughs> yes, whole thing. Right. We're gonna do our own fan fiction. We're gonna bring on the air back. <laughs> People are like, what is on the air? Like- I know, I know. <laughs> we brought it back, guys. Where can I watch it? On my YouTube channel. Yeah. It's going to be huge. I don't have any uh, community feedback, but I do have an interesting fun fact. Okay. Robert Costanzo, who plays the plumber, when I saw him, right away, I knew him. Ah, how did you know him? I knew him. One of my favorite games for the Sega CD, Sewer Shark. Uh, he was actually like one of the villains in that game. Now, so was it live action? Sewer Shark was from Digital Pictures and Hasbro Interactive. They did a line of live action video games. Night Trap. Oh yeah, Night Trap. I like that. Night Trap was the one that got everybody in trouble. Um, <laughs> it really wasn't big. It essentially, it didn't really have anything bad in it, but everybody freaked out because there was girls having a slumber party in these. These like weird ninja vampire people. Yeah, I mean, love the show. I love that game. Yeah, it was and funny. so Night Trap, uh, Sewer Shark, Ground Zero, all these live action uh, video games were being produced yeah. for a video game system called the Nemo. Now Nemo was going to be Hasbro's own video game system. This is about 1992. The week 
this system, the week or so, this system was going to launch. Night Trap and Sewer Shark were going to be the launch titles. Hasbro said, we don't have the money to make this system. We're done. We're pulling the project. So they came in, I think Sega and Sony, these are Sony produced as well. They came in, they put them out for the Sega CD because that system was just coming out and they could do it. So they put these games on the Sega CD. In Sewer Shark, uh, Robert, who played the plumber, was this this guy who was always yelling at you. Hey, dog food or whatever your name is. This is Commissioner Stenchler. Listen, pal, you're a disgrace to the exterminating profession. If I didn't have this pressing dinner engagement, I'd come right down there and I'd... I'd... He'd deck you! Yeah, I'd deck you. Um, you were... Sewer Shark, you were, like, in this pod in the sewers, and you were shooting these sewer rats with these beams, and you had to memorize the right sewer to take or you'd crash into a wall and die. Huh. And you had to make it out. And when you... I beat the game... When you make it out, you land on this beach, and the guy, uh, Robert, who plays the plumber, he's on the beach sipping drinks, and the whole time you think he's, like, somewhere else because he has a fake backdrop, and then your pod comes crashing out of the beach. The search didn't stop them. They'll be coming for me now. To the jet bike! Your shark bait! I don't know. It wasn't a great ending. But I recognized him right away. I was like, I know that man. Well, come to find out, also, one of the biggest voices, in my opinion, he's ever done, he played Harvey Bullock from the Batman series. He was in Batman, Mask of the Phantasm, the Batman Adventures, and the animated series in the 90s. And he also did a lot of other voice work, and he's had small parts in so many shows and movies throughout his career. He's still doing stuff, but his voice... I was like, oh, I recognize his voice. Because I used to watch the animated series. You remember Batman the animated oh, yeah. series? Yeah. Commissioner? Nope. Me. I got a problem. And you want my help? Let's get something straight from the get-go. I think you're a freak and a menace, and those are your good points. But the commission says you serve a purpose, so I go along. I appreciate your honesty. So him and Betty do voice work in video games. Very cool. Kind of cool. Yeah, it's a thing. And of course, I was thinking about video games, and you mentioned Night Trap, and made me think of that uh, I bought the 3DO system. <laughs> it was like... Oh, was the 3DO that failed. Yes, it was like, oh, they're just getting into CDs, and it's yes. going to be a big thing. And I think I spent like my whole uh, That's like, expensive. Tax, tax refund on it. That like was that. A, wasn't was a $1,000 system? It might have been close to 800 It was, it was, it was between 500 and $800, something like that. But at the time, I was like, I'm going to be getting the, the best, biggest thing. And, and it, it like, failed. It failed. But I had Night Trap, and I really loved, uh, uh, what is the game there? The, the motorcycle game where... Uh, Road Rash? Road Rash. Kicking and hitting people while you're driving a motorcycle. Those were the days. But they, I did love these in, these live interaction things. Me too. It, it was really interesting to have. Night Trap, you currently can get on current systems, and it's been revamped. I'm th- I gotta get it. It's 14 bucks. Okay. PSN. Yeah, and that, that was like kind of like a choose your own adventure type of thing that where, depending on your actions, would. would you had to trap them. But if you didn't trap them, you would get killed. Yes, you yeah. would lose. Right. There's another one with Corey. Came. I think it's called Double Switch. Huh. You're in a hotel. This was my favorite one. I don't remember this one. You're in a hotel, and there's a series of traps. It's the same premise. Ah. But, you know, Corey Feld and Corey Haim. Yes. Corey Haim was in this. He was the big name. All these people would come into the hotel, and they all get room numbers. <laughs> and you got to remember the room numbers. There was four or five floors, yeah. and it would tell you where you got to go, and you had to hit the trap when I, I forget what was after them. Yes. Or you would lose, just like a night trap. It was basically a night trap with a different scenario. I love them, too. Yeah. So much fun. Uh, But back then, it was the only game I would have. You had to memorize it all. Now you have guides. Back then, it was just like writing stuff down, trying to remember (laughs) it, you know, like, what's going to happen? Right. Yeah, those were great. Uh, Those were the days. They were. So I digress. (laughs) Yeah, we'll do a video game spinoff show. All right, when we're 50, yeah. we'll, do a, we'll do a gaming. But I guess we have one more episode of On the Air coming up shortly. So your homework is to watch episode 7 on the old YouTube, and we'll be talking about that. Also, we have the best of episode. 
How's that coming? You, you're, you're just about done uh, editing. Oh, uh, it is in the can, Ben. People are going to love it. Why not release it right now, then? Nope. You got to wait. <laughs> you got to open your Christmas present on Christmas Eve. I think it's going to be big. I think it's going to be a huge. This is like, I, I think hope it's so. bigger and better every year. It is. I don't even know. Maybe we should stop after this. I don't know how we're going to top this one. Yes. I feel like next year we have to go back to our roots and bring it down some. Because I don't think we could top it. Well, back in those days, it was just you and I talking about the year, right? Yeah, yeah. Our first best of was just that. It was just us saying, like, let's reflect on the year. And then we give it to Scott Ryan. And he just, you know, takes Tur- it. Yeah. He just takes it and runs. And yeah. you really, you, you, you had this idea I, to make. Uh, a- I had the idea, but this one, I, I had the idea, but Scott and Josh Mitten really made it their own. And, like, with the interviews you got, that's what's going to make this very special in the community who came to us with the really cool ads, mm. which nobody's heard yet. Um, and there's sketch comedy. I'll give you another little, there's a little thing. There's going to be sketch comedy in this. Ah, kind of works with our end of the year on the air type of thing. It's all kind of. Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> it is kind of, yeah. Kind of, it's, a, it's, it's in the same world, isn't it, in some wow. ways? Wow. How did that? I don't know how it happened. It just all came together. It's a great coincidence. Yes, it is. It all came together. So sketch comedy, we get the best of clips. We got some really cool things. Scott and Josh uh, host the show. It's going to be a lot of fun. I can't wait. Yeah, very excited. Christmas Eve. Ca- Christmas Eve. Yes, Christmas Eve morning. You have all week to enjoy it. Oh. When you open your presents, you can put our show on. <laughs> you like, what are you listening to? You should be listening to Christmas music. Yes. No, you're listening to Twin Peaks Unwrapped. I like it. Yeah. All right, Ben. If anybody's got a comment, question, or theory about Twin Peaks, David Lynch, or on the air, Send us the email at TwinPeaksUnwrapped at gmail.com. You can give us that five-star review on the iTunes. Give us a nice little review. Also, you can like us on Google Play. We're on Stitcher. We're on Spotify. If you're on your favorite console, you can listen to us on Spotify. How cool is that? Also, last-minute gift shopping, Public. All your TPU needs are all up there. Mugs, cell phone cases, sweatshirts, T-shirts, hoodies. A small portion of the proceeds will, you know, help us keep the lights on for the next year. Also, you can like us on Facebook. You can follow us on the old Twitter. And I think that's about it, Ben. And, Brian, I just want to say, uh, if I don't see you, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Ben. Second day of Christmas, my true love gave to me two secret diaries and a body dead wrapped in plastic. On the third day of Christmas, my true love gave to me three possessed souls, two secret diaries and a body dead wrapped in plastic. Diane, on the fourth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me Four talking logs, three possessed souls, two secret diaries, and a body dead, wrapped in plastic. On the fifth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me five jelly donuts. Four talking logs, three possessed souls, two secret diaries, and a body dead, wrapped in plastic. On the sixth day of Christmas, my sweetheart gave to me six fish and a percolator. Five jelly donuts. Four talking logs. Three possessed souls. Two secret diaries. And a body dead, wrapped in plastic. On the seventh day of Christmas, my true love gave to me seven one-armed men. Six fish and a percolator. Five jelly Four talking logs, three possessed souls, two secret diaries, and a body dead, wrapped in plastic. Diane, on the eighth day of Christmas, I had a strange dream. 
Eight dancing midgets. Seven one-armed men. Six fish and a percolator. Five, oh, five jelly donuts. Sorry. Oops. Four talking logs. Three possessed souls. Two secret diaries. And a body dead, wrapped in plastic. On the ninth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me nine owls lurking. Eight dancing midgets. Seven one-armed men. Six fish and a percolator. Five. Jelly donuts. Four talking logs. Three possessed souls. Two secret diaries. And a body dead, wrapped in plastic. On the tenth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me ten drooling Leo. Nine owls lurking. Eight dancing midgets. Seven one-armed men. Six fish and a percolator. Five jelly donuts. Four talking logs. Three possessed souls. Two secret diaries. And a body dead, wrapped in plastic. On the eleventh day of Christmas, my true love gave to me eleven cherry pies. Ten drooling Leo. Nine owls lurking. Eight dancing midgets. Seven one-armed men. Six fish and a percolator. Five jelly donuts. Four talking logs. Three possessed souls. Two secret diaries and a body dead, wrapped in plastic. On the twelfth day of Christmas, my sweetheart gave to me twelve cups of coffee, lemon cherry pie, ten drooling Leo, nine owls lurking, eight dancing midgets, seven one-armed men, six fish and a percolator. Five Four talking logs. Three possessed souls. Two secret diaries. And a body dead, wrapped in plastic. Amen. Amen. Amen.